Welcome to Nutrient Management in a Soil Health System, a video presented by American Farmland Trust and Cargill Region Connect as part of our Soil Health video series. If you haven't checked out the other videos in the series, be sure to look through the options on the playlist. Today's video features two conservation agronomists, Janelle Leach with Cargill and Michael Watercutter with American Farmland Trust. They will be connecting the dots between soil health and nutrient management. Both are stationed in the Midwest and focused on conservation and soil health practices for farms across the region. If you've watched other videos in the series, you will see some familiar faces once again in this video. Soil health farmers Greg, Eric, Rorick, and Daryl are back again, providing their experiences and perspective throughout the episode. It is important to understand that soil health and nutrient management go hand in hand. Good soil health practices will include wise use of fertilizer, whether synthetic or organic. Fertilizer is critical to raising crops. It can also impact the environment if not managed properly. This is why nutrient management is critical to farm management. It impacts yield and quality of the crop. We have to feed the crop in order for the plants to perform all the internal and biological functions to give us the outcomes that we need. Nutrient management is a very important part to farming and soil health. Knowing what we have in our soils for our cash crops is very important. So we know what fertilizer we need to apply or those practices to implement to help make those nutrients more available in our soils. So our long-term goals is to reduce inputs, improve soils, and protect the environment. So our goal is to, if we can reduce fertilization through using livestock manures or nutrient recycling through cover crops or nutrient production through like legumes. So maybe we can look at various legumes to offset some of our nitrogen costs. We make decisions about uh, how we're going to farm, what we're going to farm, you know, and, and the practices we're going to use. We try to think about what kind of an impact that's going to have on our community, as well as, you know, the next generations of our community to come. We do take a lot of pride in the fact that we believe our practices are helping water infiltrate into the ground the way it was, you know, Mother Nature designed it and intended it, as opposed to running off and, and taking nutrients valuable nutrients, expensive nutrients, especially today, into those waterways with them. So we do take a lot of pride and joy in that and, and, you know, just glad to do our part. Let's take some time to dive into the details of those four R's. Right source, right time, right place, and right rate. We'll start with Janelle and Michael providing an overview of integrating the 4R principles into your nutrient management plan before exploring each R individually. In agriculture, the 4Rs include right source, right rate, right time, and right place. The 4Rs help us better understand and guide us in nutrient management so that we can keep these nutrients in our soils and improve our environment by implementing these practices. The 4R principles are going to work to keep your fertilizers more efficient and keep those dollars on farm. We know how and when the plants use these nutrients and we know how the conversions work in the soil. It requires applications that follow the 4R principles in order to keep those nutrients on farm. So if you're just beginning with the 4R approach, I would encourage you to start with a soil test. You need to have your thumb on your nutrients. We need to have a starting baseline. Secondly, then we would discuss what resources you have. What kind of fertilizer do you use on your farm? Then we'll move into a, a game plan. Uh, how do you apply your nitrogen? How do you apply your phosphorus? What equipment do you have on farm? is going to determine, you know, how we progress through a 4R plan. By taking some soil samples, we can understand what source of fertilizer we need. Maybe the field that we are looking at does not need phosphorus, but it needs potassium. We understand that the source of the fertilizer that we need is potash, and that the extra fertilizer that we have typically been applying is not needed. Now, this year, the fertilizer prices have, have, uh, have changed people's mindsets and wanting to put more manures, get a hold of more manures and put them on farms. And as we do that, you know, the most important thing is to protect 
what we've put out there. By doing that, you know, we, we can look at reduction of tillage and we can look at cover crops as an option to protect what we've put out there. The time frame that we've been introducing, adding, uh, I guess you could say it started uh, probably 15 years ago when I first moved back from Iowa, that we started adding these cover crops and the management practices. It started again with cereal rye, you know, seeding it, planting it, and then looking at the termination. Then we started to work with area farmers to put manure on the land as another uh, avenue to improve soil health. I like manure because it has not just nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, but it has all your micros. And if you use certain composted manures versus some others, you can really get some, some benefits of recharging the soil with those additional, I guess, bacteria and bugs, you could say. The right time for nutrient application is best optimized when the crop is, needs it. In the case of nitrogen, there are many different sources that we can use. But when we place nitrogen in a corn crop, we want to make sure to time it correctly so that the corn crop can use the nitrogen to its highest availability and not be lost to leaching or volatilization. You don't want to apply broadcast before a heavy rain. If you're going to reduce tillage or have a no-till system, you want your, your P and K placed at the right time to where you're not going to have massive amounts of runoffs, right? You want that to gradually go into the soil. If, if we take it from a single application nitrogen up front before the plant, that that gives us so much room to, to lose, right? The weather, the nitrates are gonna go through through the soil uh, and we call that leaching, or, or we're gonna denitrify and lose it you know, into gas. But if we can remove just that one application, split it into two, we're, we're increasing our efficiency. That's better than just the one application. Putting that nitrogen down when the plant needs it is going to actually decrease the amount of loss but increase the efficiency through that corn plant. It is best practice to fertilize for the crop you're growing. We know that sometimes you have to fertilize for two years. So if we are going to fertilize for two years, it's important to keep all of those nutrients on farm. We need to have a green crop on that field until the next year's crop is ready to pull those nutrients. It's important to protect what you're putting out there. Because you want to learn to see how, what manures and cover crops work together and complement each other. Some work great together, some don't. You know, manure, uh, for example, swine manure has a, a lot of salt in it. So you got to be aware of, uh, make sure you uh, don't apply the the cover crop before the manure application because that salt may impact the germination, but you also want to get the, the cover crop out in a timely manner so you can utilize all the nitrogen that's available in that manure. Probably the biggest challenge that we've dealt with and had to manage through was uh, um, you know, carbon to nitrogen uh, ratio imbalances by using certain cover crops ahead of corn as an example. And you know, we've, we've learned from that, that you know, if we are gonna do that, we need to, to manage those cover crops better and maybe terminate earlier or use a, 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 a lesser rate of you know, certain cover crops out there uh, ahead of corn. You know, cereal rye is a great example of that. Cereal rye is a wonderful cover crop and we like to use that in a lot of our cover crop mixes, but if you're not careful, you can you can harm your your next corn crop so understanding those things managing through that and making um, accommodations deal with the challenges that might come from that the right place is important so that we keep those nutrients in the soil for a cash crop doing this our growing crop can better utilize those nutrients for maximum efficiency instead of broadcasting our fertilizer over bare ground apply it over a growing cover crop. Using subsurface placement so that those nutrients are held in place to better utilize by the crop. So you reduce tillage, you know, we're not going to, um, you know, necessarily distribute the nutrients anymore, right? So we go in with that strip till equipment, we're placing that fertilizer exactly where it needs to be, right? The roots are gonna go straight into it, Again, uh, fo following the 4R principles, you know, right place, right timing, right, right rate, and, uh, and, and the right placement. The right rate means that we are applying nutrients at the correct rate for the crop's needs. By applying at the right rate, 
we can save time and money using soil sampling to find out what the crop needs and apply those nutrients to optimize crop yield. There's math that uses the soil test, the organic matter, that we can use a calculation to tell us how many units of nitrogen are needed. Now, the more efficient we place that nitrogen, we can back those numbers off. I always encourage people to try test strips. Those test strips, uh, it's, it's look at it as research on your farm, right? The more efficient you know, our applications are, the more we follow that 4R, the more chance that we can reduce, reduce our nitrogen. If you're gonna trial on farm and determine how low you can go with your nitrogen, um, you know, I would encourage you to do, you know, a couple rows, you know, uh, a couple passes side by side, right? Do, do two or three, you know, passes at, at one rate and then do, you know, two or three passes right next to that, reduce that rate. And I always go by 20 pounds, go another, another couple passes and reduce it even more. And then, uh, you can use, you know, all of the data technology that we have to follow that, to follow those test strips and decide uh, what works best on your farm. It's specific to your farm. Like what is your organic matter? You know, if you have 6% organic matter, reduce your nitrogen all day long. But if you're just, you know, starting out and you're like at 1.6%, don't reduce your nitrogen yet. You know, like we haven't stabilized that soil. The confounding part of it all was most if not all, land-grant universities were recommending 1.2 pounds of nitrogen per unit of corn. 200 bushel, 240 pounds of nitrogen. So atmospheric, you know, what's in the soil, and then what do you apply? And then those losses that are associated with those and how you mitigate those, whether it's a nitrogen inhibitor or, yada, or whatever you're doing, manure, composting, we've done all of those things. And we noticed in our ROI piece that we started matching up hybrids because we got more information on the genetics, we got more information on the timing, we got more information on, on charting of, of what, their, what their research plots across all over the world were showing on response to these particular applications and combinations of applications, whether it's soil-borne or whether it's fertigation, what, what was it? And we found, and it, again, it's a trust level. We dropped it to 0.8. Wow, a third. Woo. But it fit our ROI yield real well. I mean, we were still growing over our APH, over our 10-year average. You've just heard the technical experts, as well as the farmer experts, express how important soil tests are to designing your nutrient management plan and integrating those four R's. Janelle and Michael are now going to go into more detail about soil sampling and testing to achieve the best overall picture of how your soils are performing. Much of the four R's relies on knowing about your soil. A good soil testing program is so critical for nutrient management. This will allow us to make accurate decisions. This includes what soil type you have, what nutrient levels are available, and what nutrients are not available cation exchange capacity, or your CEC, and organic matter. Soil sampling is one of the best ways to do this. When figuring out our nutrient management plan on our farm, taking soil tests is the first step and probably the most important one. There are many ways to soil sample. First is to grid sample. This means to lay a grid over the whole field to find sample points. Those grids can range in size of one, two and a half, and five acres. Taking soil samples this way will help you understand how your nutrient levels vary across the field. There will be roughly eight soil cores taken in each grid that will make one soil sample. A second method is zone sampling. This method uses different soil types throughout the field and can use historical yield maps and satellite imagery. Overlapping these data layers can improve the zone map in your field. The zones can range in size and will affect how many soil samples will be taken. When your field is sampled by zone or grid, you can generate a variable rate recommendation based off your soil test results and your typical yield goal. These variable rate maps will tell you exactly where and how much fertilizer is needed to apply. Taking soil samples every two to four years will help you understand your field 
and set up an effective nutrient management strategy. I encourage farmers to use more precision ag, to use resource professionals to help them tackle the nutrient management on their farm. Doing soil sampling and then taking those recommendations and determining where we need to make, say, a fertilizer application, a manure application, what we're deficient on, uh, what we need to do. At whatever level, at the acre level, obviously has significant benefits to the climate. Significant. But again, I'm going to go back to the soil test piece. How do I benchmark my farm? Who, who needs to be involved in that? And it comes at a significantly high cost. Those tests are expensive compared to a, just a soil test. So what I ask those people to do is take that conventional soil test and run it through again and tell me if, 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 there's, if, if there's any uh, conclusive evidence that we're doing the right thing based off of our, our traditional system. And out of that board, you know, now, it's, now you're seeing all these companies that are coming with soil DNA and, and which has to happen to drive the cost down so that these, these samples will make a difference. The way we manage nutrients on our farm is, uh, uh, first of all, I, I work with an agronomist that uh, is, is much better educated in, in helping decipher what my soil tests are telling me. He does soil testing for us as well, and we're on a three-year rotation on that, so it goes with our crop rotation. The beautiful thing with him is he doesn't sell fertilizer or chemicals, so he uh, helps work with us um, on you know determining what's best for for the soil. Um, we've outfit our planter with in furrow um, uh, fertilizer, liquid fertilizer application for every single row, not just corn rows, but corn and soybeans. And so we are trying to, you know, be responsible and put nutrients where they're needed in a quantity that they're needed at the time that they're needed to, you know, maximize the benefit of those nutrients and, and give the plant the best chance of, of being highly productive. So nutrient management, we've always chuckled about that. We have always, because our soils, organic matters and pHs, we don't have a lot of available. When we're done, we have, we have very little nitrogen left. We have very little phosphorus left. We have the micros. I mean, all of that stuff is not in our soil until recently understanding with some of the testing procedures that, that we were just locking up pathways. Before we leave you with a few final thoughts from our farmers, I want to remind everyone to hit that subscribe button to be notified anytime a new video in our soil health series is added to the playlist. You can find more information about Cargill Region Connect or American Farmland Trust by following the links in the video description. As always, thank you to our technical experts and farmers for sharing their time and knowledge to continue promoting soil health and agriculture. And thank you for tuning in. Till next time. Regenerative Ag, the concept is how we can do a holistic farm management approach. That's kind of what I, I envision it. And with it, like I said, with that management approach is, you know, integrating livestock, uh, reducing some of our need for commercial fertilizers and other aspects, which we're always, we're going to need commercial fertilizer, yes. But this year, for example, is, is a prime example when we see those inputs just skyrocket that if we can find methods to reduce it, why not? Nutrient management, again, is a, it is very farm specific. It's very provider specific. It's very capital specific. Uh, and and it, it comes down to a 100 micron screen and whether the stuff that you buy will flow through it. I mean, that is how fundamental nutrient management is. But on the, on the bigger picture side, it's probably one, of the, probably one of the greatest opportunities to really dial in what your capabilities, what your soil, what your, your kind of your historical and what your goals are within your soil health uh, management strategy is. You really can dial it in but it takes an investment. It takes a look back over your shoulder. It takes the, your willingness to really understand and develop a comfort level with change.